we are here in the Reformation Heritage Books warehouse, surrounded by boxes and boxes of excellent books. Uh, but there are a few books that we would especially like to highlight as really important books if you would like to start reading the Puritans and about the Puritans. Because there's no group of writers mm -hmm. in church history that are so helpful to Christians to teach them to grow in holiness and maturity and to have scriptural answers for all the questions and riddles of life than the Puritans. There are certain books and certain authors that have touched each one of us in a special way and that we have found very helpful as uh, we have walked with the Lord and uh, also that we believe are helpful for other people as they seek to read. One of my favorite Puritan books um, is by John Flavel and it's now been put into an easier format in two paperback books. Uh, Christ in His Threefold Office and Christ Humbled Yet Exalted. Um, this was originally titled The Fountain of Life, and that really expresses uh, Flavel's heart, I think, about Christ. And these are some of the richest um, writings about who Christ is and especially what Christ has done for us mm -hmm. as our prophet, our priest, and our king that I've ever encountered. Um, they're a real delight to read, and I'd highly recommend them. And um, it's almost like taking a class in the doctrine of Christ, and yet at a level that people can understand. Yeah, yeah there's a there's a, a minister down south, and he um, every single morning, every single morning, he's in his office and he's speaking for a long time. And there was a, another minister staying in his home, and he said, uh, what are you doing every morning? You, you talk, are you praying that long? Yeah. And the guy said, no, I'm just, every morning for years, I've read through the entire works, all six volumes of John Flavel. Wow. I read one sermon every morning, and it just food for my soul. It's the way I start my day. Mm. I get done with volume six, I start over at volume one. Wow, <laughs> so, that's great. Wow, that's great. You yeah. can imagine how spiritual that man is by now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, my first book is Heaven Taken by Storm by Thomas Watson. Subtitle, Showing the Holy Violence a Christian is to put forth in the pursuit after glory. If you want to begin reading the Puritans, I often say to people, this is the very best book I know for beginning. It reads easy. Watson has short sentences, contrary to some other Puritans. And this book is all about how do you use the various means of grace? How do you use the Lord's Day? How do you use various spiritual disciplines? How do you meditate? How do you pray? Uh, and how do you converse with other of God's people for your own spiritual benefit? Very, very practical. It will help you grow up as a Christian. This is Thomas Watson, Heaven Taken by Storm. Mm. That, that so expresses the kind of militant, energetic approach that the Puritans had to the spiritual life, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's a warfare, not a warfare fought in a way that harms people's bodies, but a warfare for the sake of people's souls. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's a good point, Paul, because, you know, when you talk about holy violence, mm. you might first think, oh, you know, saying that about God, you, you, you can't use holy violence against God. But the Puritans mean by that, you know, that the whole theme of Isaiah 64, verse 7, where God complains that no one takes hold of him, mm. you know, mm. because God wants his people to wrestle with him. But mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a bold, fist-in-your-face violence. It's a, it's a warm, embracing, loving violence. You know, Lord, do as thou hast said. Yeah. You know, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Pursuing the Lord. Pursuing the yeah. Lord. If you're curious about who the Puritans were, and how they led their lives, especially in the light of the many caricatures that are made today. I mean, nobody's slandered as much as the Puritans are. Uh, they're really depicted as awful people. But a book that is really helpful for correcting those caricatures is Leland Ryken's book. Um, it's called Worldly Saints, the Puritans as they really were. And um, 
Uh, I really enjoyed reading this book when I was first studying the Puritans. It covers a number of different topics ranging from the Puritans' view of money to marriage and sexuality, the church, Bible, education, even, even kids and how you handle kids. It shows that the Puritans were very human, um, that they basically were people who were just trying to follow God's word in every area of life. Mm. So there's a lot of wisdom in here, and there's also a lot of good history to learn about who the Puritans were. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I know Leland myself, and uh, he's, he's a, a serious man, godly man. And when I first saw this book, when it was many years ago when it first came out, mm-hmm. worldly saints, I thought, oh, what yeah. in the world? Yeah. Because the Puritans are very opposed to worldliness. And then I understood, oh yeah, he's, what he's trying to say is that the Puritans wanted to live their whole life in this world to the glory of God. So mm. they, yeah. they, they, they're not monks. They don't go into a, a cloister. They, the book is really about how to live every area of life for the glory of God. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, um, this isn't, I'm excited about this book. Actually, I co-authored it with uh, Michael Reeves from Wales. And it's called Following God Fully, an Introduction to the Puritans. So Riken is great. It would be a better book if you want to go into some depth. If you don't know a lot about the Puritans, this is designed to be your, your, your intro book to, to, to read about the Puritans. And, and we, we divided it up into uh, five or six categories. First, we look at who are the Puritans. Then we look at some of the, briefly, some of the bios, some of the exciting life stories of, of some of the major, of major Puritans, eight of them. And then we look at various themes, like what did the Puritans really teach about the triune God and about the work of salvation and Mm. how we commune with him. Mm. And once we're saved, how do you live the Christian life? What do you experience? And so we look at those kinds of themes. And then the next part deals with Christ's bride as the church. What did the Puritans talk about? The means of grace and church and so on. And then the Puritans in their daily lives. And... Finally, the last section is the Puritans for today. So this is a short book, 150 pages, written at a very basic level. This is for people who say, you know what? I don't really know the Puritans very well. Where can I go for a starter, an appetizer? Following God fully. The title was taken from Caleb, Numbers 14, 24. He followed God fully. All the days of his life. That's a beautiful statement. And that's a, that's a foundational element in Puritan thinking. If God is the living God, the Puritans would say, he's worth following completely. Amen. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one thing I appreciated about that book is the fact that the chapters are very short. Mm. And so it's very easy for somebody just to to read a nugget about one of the Puritans or one of their teachings. It's not at all overwhelming. It's a great introduction. Yeah, well, we're hoping people use it as daily devotional because it's short enough for that. Yeah, Yeah. it would be appropriate for that. One book by the Puritans that has been really helpful to a lot of people in terms of their spiritual life is a book by Thomas Brooks called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. We're all, as Christians, aware of the fact that Satan tempts us, but nobody like the Puritans has ever analyzed Mm. how Satan tempts us, the different kinds of approaches that he takes, the the ways that he twists the truth, and how, how clever he is, but also how we can resist him. And Thomas Brooks just goes through and he considers um, lots of different cases, ways that the devil can make sin look really good so that we, we see the bait but we don't see the hook. And then he, he lays out several remedies for each one of those kinds of temptations. It's a very equipping book and um, it's a very practical book for Christians to use. So. Thomas Brooks, and this is part of the Puritan paperback series. So this is a Puritan work that has been slightly revised and edited mm. to make it more easy for the modern reader to read. Mm. Mm. Yeah, this, this, this is a classic, uh, a classic. And I, um, 
I was at a gathering once with Reverend Irfan Hughes in Pennsylvania. He was pastor then in Grove City, and Grove City College is there. Mm -hmm. And it was just a beautiful thing, but on Sunday nights after church, there were like 60 to 70 young people that would come over to his house mm. every Sunday night. And they would sit on the floor. You couldn't even see the color of the carpeting, literally, shoulder to shoulder, they'd sit on the floor. And he would take them through this book. Oh, that's great. And so I sat there and listened, and uh, he would read a couple sentences, and he'd make a comment, and he'd say, any questions? And hands are going up all over the room. It's mm. so practical for today. Mm. And mm. he got through three quarters of a page, you know, in the evening. Wow. And the next week, I suppose you do a, well, maybe a page and a half. Mm. But for years, they were going through this book, talking about all of Satan's devices mm. and, and that type of thing and so relevant, so practical for today. Imagine talking about a book like this for, for five years with young people. <laughs> what, uh -huh. what modern book would you find that would keep their attention for five years? Mm. Here it is, an old classic. Anyway, I love, I love uh, Brooks anyway. Yeah. So I, what I'm going to do right now is I want to lift up two books because these belong together and um, I wrote this book with Randall Peterson, Meet the Puritans with a Guide to Modern Reprints. Now this book gives you the life story in more depth than following God fully of not just five or ten Puritans, but all 150 Puritans that have been reprinted since the 1960s or late 50s. So the resurgence of Puritan literature actually has happened in the last 60 some years. And the goal of this book is, you can use this as a daily devotional too, to every day read one life story or you know, move through these stories, be moved by what the Lord has done. Most of these Puritans were in prison at some point in their lives for preaching the gospel. But their, their life stories are fascinating. But the second thing in this book is that underneath each life story, um, we give a summary, usually two, sometimes three or four paragraphs, of all 700 books these 150 authors have in print today. So there's 700 Puritan titles in here that you can read about. Then you can decide, well, would I like to buy it? Would I like to buy that book? We give you the publisher's name, the, um, the date of publication, the pagination, and so on. So you get the, this is biography and bibliography mm. of the Puritans. And then this book is their theology. So this is the first of its kind, a Puritan theology, Doctrine for Life, which I wrote with Mark Jones. You could say it's kind of a, a one volume systematic theology of the Puritan teaching. And I don't think there's anything else like it on the market. But what Mark and I have done is we've looked at 50 areas of theology, 5-0, where the Puritans have contributed something very substantial. Mm -hmm. So, Providence of God, wow. John Flavel, The Mystery of Providence, what a classic. So of course we gotta have a chapter in here on The Mystery of Providence. And what we do is we follow like a regular systematic theology. We follow the doctrine of prolegomena, which is about the revealed Word of God, then the doctrine of God, doctrine of man, doctrine of Christ, salvation, the church, the last things. And then we take uh, nine chapters to talk about theology and practice. How did the Puritans take each one of these doctrines and how did they apply it to their own life, to their home life, to their daily prayer life, to their meditation, to their conscience, to increase their own zeal, and what are the practical lessons from the Puritans for today? Mm. So that's yeah. the goal of this book, to show you how they interwove theology and practice. Mm. And that's what we need to do today as, as well. Now, the nice thing about reading this book is we purposely wrote it so every chapter is standalone. I mean, it's a big book. So what I would advise you to do when you get it is maybe take one of the back chapters that talk about some practical area of life. Let that whet, whet your appetite. Mm. And then go back to the beginning and, and probably read it straight through. And this will give you a really good feel for what the Puritans really believed. So this is your intro. 
to biography and bibliography, this is your intro to Puritan theology across the board. Two great resources, to be sure. Yeah. If you would like to uh, dig a little bit more into some specific aspects of Puritan theology, another helpful resource is A Quest for Godliness by J.I. Packer. Mm. Packer's actually the person who, through his writings, first introduced me to the Puritans. Mm. Um, I remember reading Packer's Knowing God, and um, that kind of led me on a journey where I started to read, well, John Owen and some of the other Puritans mm. as well. So I really appreciate the way Packer leads people to the Puritans and commends the Puritans for the way that they really sunk their roots deep into Scripture and then sought to produce the fruit of a godly Christian life. So this book would be a little bit more technical sometimes in the way that he approaches things, but it's an excellent study of uh, different doctrines of the Puritans. Some of the chapters are um, a little bit more historical. Uh, why we need the Puritans would be a good introduction to the strengths of the Puritans. Um, another chapter is Puritanism as a movement of revival. Um, many people, of course, are very interested in revival today, but they don't recognize that the Puritans were deeply concerned about revival. Mm. They just didn't call it revival, they called it reform, a reformation. Um, this also has some great chapters on John Owen and um, some of his teachings, and uh, also the practical Christian life. So this can be a very inspiring book, even though it's a little bit more academic. Uh, it's also a book that really speaks to the heart, mm. and I appreciated it for that. Yeah, I, I'll never forget reading reading that book. Oh, I was a young man at that time, when it, and it just fed my soul. So I couldn't wait to read the next chapter. Yeah, <laughs> Pecker is one of the one of the greatest Puritan scholars who, who makes Puritanism applicable to people today. Mm. So right. he, he just does a wonderful job of uh, storing up godliness through the Puritans in the life of the believer. Yeah. Mm. Here are two books that, one written by Thomas Goodwin, and one extracts of Thomas Goodwin. Thomas Goodwin and John Owen are sometimes considered to be the two premier theologians of the Puritan movement. Now, a lot of people think they prefer John Owen over Thomas Goodwin. I'm one of those oddballs that says, Goodwin's number one for me. <laughs> I've, I, I've, uh, he's been my favorite Puritan for most, of, most of my life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. God used his book, Christ Our Mediator, when I was a teenager uh, to, to set my soul at liberty in Christ and to, mm. to, to know Christ better personally. And uh, ever since then, I just, I can't get enough of Thomas Goodwin. So um, this book, Habitual Sight of Him, The Christ-Centered Piety of Thomas Goodwin, what uh, Mark Jones and I did in this book is we, we gave, this is part of a series of books called Profiles in Reformed Spirituality. We gave a summary in 15, 20 pages or so of the piety of Thomas Goodwin in his own life, his godliness. And then we extracted from his works, this is literally meant to be a daily devotional, um, a number of different um, short pieces all about Jesus, showing how everything about Christ is to be known and felt and experienced. And so if you want to grow in a personal experiential knowledge of Christ, uh, this is a wonderful little book to get, I believe, that will help you understand the experiential connection between Christ and his work, humiliation, exaltation, his offices, his natures, for your own soul. And then this book, is Christ set forth, Christ set forth um, by Thomas Goodwin himself. And the subtitle is The Cause of Justification and the Object of Justifying Faith. This is a glorious book of Christology that can feed your soul. And you, you begin to understand when you read a book like this, Christ is my justification, he's my sanctification. Well, Paul, you're right. After all, he's my all and in all. Amen. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
And that's where you want to camp. That's where you want to spiritually camp all your life. That Christ becomes more and more. He must increase and I must decrease. This book will help that, help you to, to grow in Christ appreciation and in some ways in self depreciation. Thomas Goodwin, Christ set forth. You know, one of the one of the first teaching assistant projects you ever gave to me had to do with Goodwin and his writings on Christ, mm. and they were so sweet. Mm. He he had such a, a depth of reflection on the love of Jesus mm. um, and the, the the fullness and sufficiency of Jesus. Talking about that for our justification. Another book that he wrote about the heart of Christ towards us, even now while he's in heaven. Mm. It's just so touching. Yeah. It's solid theology, and yet it's it's so sweetly devotional yeah. when you read it. Yeah. 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 It's great stuff. Very good. Um, another book that's kind of considered a classic for studying and understanding the Puritans is by uh, Martin Lloyd Jones. It's called The Puritans, Origins and Successors. And um, Lloyd-Jones was one of the men whom God used to really bring about the revival of Puritan studies in the 20th century. Um, he quoted the Puritans at a time when the reading of them had really fallen into decline since the late 19th century. And so Lloyd-Jones was personally responsible under the sovereignty of God for really getting people to go back to the Puritans at a time when we had lost sight um, as a people of the, just the way they combined solid biblical reform doctrine with a very vibrant, warm Christian life. So, and of course, that, that was characteristic of Lloyd-Jones himself. He was theology on fire, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's the way his preaching was yeah. described. So, this book is a collection of addresses that he gave through the years at uh, the Westminster Conferences. And it, it really is a wide-ranging collection. It actually includes a number of things that go beyond the Puritans themselves, um, reaching as far back as John Knox and as far forward as um, the Sandemanian area. Uh, but there are also some really, really helpful articles in here, chapters in here on the Puritans themselves. Uh, there's there's an article here, Puritanism and its origins. It's a really helpful introduction to, well, historically speaking, how did the Puritan movement start and what was going on in England at that point in time? So it really frames it well. There's another excellent article here on revival, uh, a survey of that, which was something that was also very near and dear to Martin Lloyd Jones's heart. Mm -hmm. So this is another really helpful resource if you just want to learn about the Puritans. Very good, very good. Yeah, like you mentioned, Lloyd Jones actually was the the mover and the shaker behind the whole resurrection of Puritan studies. But then one of his best friends was Ian Murray, right. and Ian Murray is really the guy who got it off the ground with a banner of truth. Mm. And Lloyd Jones would promote that, and Murray would be writing <laughs> the articles and the books and Together, they made a wonderful combination, mm. and they had a dear brother who came along and financed it in those early days. And uh, wow, what a difference Banner Truth Trust has made over the years. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Reformation Heritage books, when we began um, back, yeah, 1994 or so, um, Banner Truth Trust has always been my, my model, my mentor in my mind. and. Um, we just said, well, we're not in competition with them. We're supporting them. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to do more of that in North America and do in North America what they've been doing in UK and, of course, North America as well and promote, promote the Puritans. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, we publish a lot of other things. But right now we've got a project of 84 Puritan titles that we're doing in seven years, one per month, uh, 84 new titles in the Puritans. And we're, all, we're still only scratching the surface. These men are so rich in their writings. Well, the last one I want to talk about is something very dear to my heart. Uh, I've actually wanted to do this all my life, and we finally did it the last year. 
It's the complete works of Thomas Goodwin. Hardback, beautiful hardback edition, 12 volumes. I mean, if you can afford it, get Christ set forth, get your appetite whetted on Thomas Goodwin. But if you can't afford it, this set is, is a gem. It's a gem. And um, what it does is it collects in 12 volumes here. You see the other 11 volumes down there. All of his writings, and several of them are expositions of passages of Scripture, like Ephesians 1, right. Ephesians 2, hundreds and hundreds of pages, but just wonderful in-depth material for the soul. And then he's got a book on, on, on Revelation. He's got um, a book on, you mentioned, The Heart of Christ in Heaven right. Towards Sinners on Earth. Right. Yeah. What a book that is. Just a short little book, probably no more than 100 pages. And uh, he argues in that book that Christ in Heaven is better for us than Christ walking on Earth for us. Because now he's exalted. He has his full capacity centered on his people. He can hear every whisper of a cry. He sends out his spirit to indwell us. Yeah. And when he was on earth, he could only be one place at a time mm. in his human nature. But now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He can remember all of his people at once, millions and millions, because he's infinite in capacity. And he can remember each one of his children and intercede for them every single moment, Goodwin argues, as if you were his only child. Think about that. He's praying for you right now, Paul. Mm -hmm. yep. Right now. Yep. Right now. I wouldn't make it without that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah. so the intercession of Christ, I always call that the most, the most underestimated doctrine in all of theology. The constant intercession of Christ. Right. And Goodwin opens that up in, in this book like no one else I know. Then he has a very special book on the work of the Holy Spirit. A whole book on how the Holy Spirit works salvation and one a, a classic on justifying faith a full volume on what election is Th this is just a great set of books by one of the two best puritan theologians that have ever lived so sometimes you know it's better to go deep into one author than to skim over a lot of them and we live in a day in which so many people just want to get everything from internet maybe little snippets of things right but if you want to really grow as a christian go go deep into an author like uh thomas goodwin or go deep into jonathan edwards and you will you will grow uh, immensely by, by the grace of god of course yeah i i remember having that experience with william perkins when we were working on oh, yes. the set and republishing that set and reading through his um, his exposition of the Apostles' Creed, of course his golden chain, um, his commentary on Galatians, and there's just a real benefit to taking time to sitting at the feet of a particular author and soaking in him. You understand his thought better, um, you're more affected by him, it's, it's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. fully agree. Well, there's, there's one last book that I would like to highlight, and that is a book called The Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards. Um, now, Edwards is technically not a Puritan. He didn't live in the Puritan era. And yet, who is more of a Puritan than Jonathan Edwards? Because he, he embodied all the qualities that are defining qualities for a Puritan. So even though he came in the 18th century rather than the 16th and 17th centuries, we often include him and rightly so, as a Puritan. And Edwards had a mind like, a, like an x-ray machine. Mm. I mean, it, his mind was just able to penetrate so deeply, both into the Bible and also into human experience. Mm. And uh, I feel like this book really exemplifies both those qualities, because in it, Edwards takes up the subject of what is really the distinguishing mark of a truly converted person? And he, he goes to the heart, hmm. and he, he talks about the fact that so much of true Christianity has to do with the deep affections of the heart, what really motivates us hmm. to do what we do. And so part of this book is, is actually deconstructive. He, he, he walks through and says, okay, if you want to really 
discern, is this a work of God, a saving work of God in someone's life? Well, it's not this, and it's not this, and it's not that. Um, so it's not just having strong feelings. It's not having, well, these Bible verses just spontaneously came to my mind, um, or, or certain experiences like that that may or may not have anything to do with the real work of the Holy mm. Spirit. So he gets all that stuff out of the way, and then he starts moving step by step about distinguishing characteristics of true religious affections, um, how they arise from a spiritual sight of the glory of God in Jesus Christ, such that people see God in a way they've never seen him before, and they're so transformed by that. It's, a, it's an inward illumination. It's, the light goes on the inside, and that produces in them the character of Jesus, a, a true love and a humility, a, um, a meekness, a gentleness towards other people, um, which I remember when I read this book the first time, that really made an impression on me because so often when people talk about being spiritual, it's easy for them to get caught up in a kind of almost an angry zeal that can mm. be very destructive. Frankly, it can be very arrogant. Mm. Um, and, and Edward says, no, 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 that's not the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God comes, it makes people humble. It makes people gentle. It makes people kind. E even though they are now willing to absolutely stand up for what's true, and even to defend it with their very lives, but there's a there's a lamb-like meekness in them. Mm. And then he ends by talking about how really the ultimate test of true Christianity is in practical action. Mm. Um, do you really love God? How are you showing it by your actions? Do you really love people? H how are you serving people? How are you caring for them? Um, and so this is a deep book, but it's also a very practical book. It's a searching book. It, it's mm. a book that turns on that light and shines it into your own life. So it's a very humbling book to read. Very profitable for the soul, though. Wow, that's a great summary, Paul. Yeah. Let me just make a quick, before we close here, a quick historical comment on this book that's interesting as well, putting it in the context of history. Hmm, yeah. Um, so Edwards was in the first Great Awakening in the 1733, 34, and all kinds of people are being converted. And he writes this book called A Narrative of Surprising Conversions. He talks about a four-year-old being converted. And, I mean, he is, he is like 100% behind all these conversions and says, this is all the work of the Lord. And he just really uh, magnifies God's grace in it. And it's a wonderful, uplifting book to read. But then, <laughs> late 1730s, right? Some people come along and they depart from all that excitement and all that faith that they were showing. And Edwards is very troubled, like, you know, he believes in the perseverance of the saints. So these people were never saved to begin with. So then he begins to think in his own mind more about what is true and what is false in revival. He begins to come to the conclusion there's always false things. The chaff always grows up beside the wheat. And you need to be able to discern between the two. And then comes along the second wave of the revival, 1740 to 1742. And now he's examining conversions in a different way, understanding that some of them could just be caught up in the excitement of the moment. And after that wave of revival dies out, he picks up his pen and he writes this book. So this book is the mature Edwards. Really, after two waves of revival, his reflections on what is true and what is false. So I had this class from uh, Sam Logan at Westminster uh, 40 years ago, actually. And uh, it was just Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards' class. And he made us read um, the complete works of Edwards, uh, two volumes okay. and, uh, yeah. for, for a PhD class. And uh, I, I, I made it 85% through in the time I had. But what, what an experience that was. But, but I still remember Sam Logan 
holding this book up and saying, and this is the most important book in the entire corpus of Edwards. Mm -hmm. In fact, he said, I would argue it's the most important book ever written by any American theologian. Wow. This is a classic on what spiritual life is, is like. So you summarize it beautifully. So thank you for being with us so much. And go out and buy the Puritans and read them and pray that God will bless them to your soul and grow you in the Christian faith so that you too may catch the flavor of their passion when they said, life is all about this, solely failed.